What is going on, everybody? Welcome in to the North End Podcast, episode 31, our Andrew Tarbo episode. Mm. My name is Zach Graham, your host here on the North End Podcast, joined, as always, by my good buddy, on record as my best friend, it's Ian Me Show, a.k.a. E, a.k.a. Le e. James, a.k.a. Sebastian Drew E.C., a.k.a. Easter Damas, a.k.a. Pap E., Oh, Daniel, a.k.a. Chili Willie, a.k.a. E. Jan Stonkel. <laughs> e, uh, busy week for the club, busy week for us, busy week in MLS. Uh, obviously, we are now under a week away from game week, mm. I guess match week, number one. But first, how are you doing, my friend? We are across the country. I'm visiting family in Pittsburgh. You're still in the ATX. How you been, man? I've been well. We had a NBA All-Star game festivities Mm -hmm. which uh which was fun um but definitely geared up for the 25th ready to go uh i mean super exciting pod today we're already kind of jacked up um so yeah i'm i'm quite excited this is a this is a good one y'all yeah a lot to get into today and actually this is going to be a double pod week for us um because we're going to talk uh, you know, we've got two preseason matches to recap. We've got kit release um, and our new good buddy, Tom Bogert, is going to join the pod later on. We'll talk to him uh, about a little bit about him, you know, how he got to be the, the I mean, the best, the top MLS reporter, I guess, when you're you're looking for the rumors, the news. Yep. You go to Tom. Uh, obviously, we'll talk MLS. We'll talk Austin FC and uh, a couple other things in there as well but uh, first things first we got two preseason matches to recap here uh the first of them being the i guess it's fair to call it the secret match right (laughs) or at least secret for uh most of us uh because uh, it it did seem like i didn't see him i we can confirm i know a lot of people other people confirm this as well there was a small test group of users who got access to the match on their MLS season pass. Mm-hmm. Uh, so, so it wasn't completely a secret uh, and the club was tweeting out updates. And uh, we did learn even before kickoff of this match with nobody in the stands, we did learn something uh, that's pretty important to the club. Amro Tarek was posted in the starting 11 with the number three. Mm-hmm. Johan Romagna is number three and everybody put the pieces together very quickly Johan Romagna no longer a member of Austin FC well I guess a member of Austin FC but going out on loan yeah to Club Olympia um so we can talk about that a little bit later but that was the first takeaway obviously so I guess I guess we don't need to talk about it later let's talk about it now indeed what were your initial thoughts and now that we're a few days away from the loan being officially confirmed by the club how do you feel about Romagna leaving for at least this year and then the center back depth chart back down to four? The depth chart getting thinner is not great. Um, but Romagna seemed to be unhappy. Um, yeah. And I, I've i recently become not paranoid, but uh, started to think of, you know, the trajectory of this team going forward with these young guys, Romagna, and GTA and, you know, hopefully trying to develop them and see them as part of our future plans. And then we have this super successful season where, you know, we finish second in the West, we're in the Western conference finals. Um, and now has that changed? You know, do we see a Zardes signing um, come in if we didn't have that success last year? Um, and we, we, you know, could have been more content with like, all right, well, we got another near another year of uh, Moose here. Um, developing him, uh, developing some of these younger guys again, like Romagna. And now both of them are gone. And um, it's been interesting, uh, particularly with Romagna, to see kind of his fall from grace. Uh, Not that he was projected, you know, for heavy minutes or to be a large part of the rotation. I think he had the expectation that, you know, maybe there was a spot opening up for him in the starting lineup with the departure of Ruben. Um, But again, he has had injury problems that have hurt him in games that have hurt the team in games that have clearly hurt his off season um, 
stamina, um, his his form, um, mm-hmm. and it kind of seemed like he was probably a bad fit for the locker room. It, it seemed like, you know like there was some pouting. Obviously, he's dropping these kind of weird hints on his Instagram, showing pictures of himself. Like you know, so I I don't know if I feel like this is a, a bad loss for the team outside of the fact that we're just a little thinner now here on the back line. Yeah, I think I'm, I think I'm with you there. Um, it's just, and obviously we talked about Romagna's uh, unfitness, I guess, like, you know, coming yeah. in and, and it really got kicked off with the Wolf presser when they came back from Florida, where he made the comments that were not thinly veiled. It's yep. <laughs> just kind of like, Hey, he's not in shape. He's not, He's not ready for what we are looking for out of our guys in preseason. You know, this mm-hmm. isn't the time to come in and get in shape. You should be exactly. in shape coming into camp is essentially what he said. And so it just mm-hmm. kind of, it seemed like it spiraled downhill from there. Um, yeah. And, you know, I think again, like I think we wish him well, but again, if the team, and it seems like they've been pretty good with this, if the, if, like you said, if he's making any sort of stink in that locker room, they're just, they're going to go ahead and cut it out. Um, absolutely move forward. So I, I, I don't think I'm surprised to see either him getting, you know, Olympia, if he does have a good season for them and hopefully he does, you know, them picking up that purchase option or him just being done. I, I, off the top of my head, I don't remember his contract length, but if he's a free agent coming up, he's not, he's not coming back. His, his days in Verde and black, I think are, are, are done and numbered at best. I would definitely agree with that. Um, yeah, wish him well for sure, but mm-hmm. there's really not much a coach can do if you're not physically capable of meeting the demands for the team and particularly mm-hmm. your position. Yeah. Um, you know, obviously he's not a guy who covers a ton of ground mm-hmm. um, in games. Uh, Unless from- it 2021, man, those Romagna yeah. solo <laughs> missions. <laughs> hey, <laughs> hey. That, that would increase the chance that he would go down in the following minutes for sure. That's right. That's right. It was a it was a full blast effort uh, on yeah. those one plays. They were a staple of our first year. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Every loss for sure. Yeah. <laughs> and <laughs> did he ever, uh, you know, execute one? Did we ever get a goal I, off one? I, I don't think so. I don't. I mean, think- there were certainly times where he did that, and it made us at least like stand up in our chairs and get yeah, excited like, oh yeah <laughs> and then yeah, but I, it, I mean he has no goals and no assists i, I don't believe in his his uh, time here in austin so you know again we'll, we'll see how that plays out obviously he's out out there in paraguay for the rest of the year mm-hmm. um and we move forward uh the the Absolutely. rest of this lineup here obviously Tarek getting in there this seems to be the second unit so to speak. And there's, there's really one name on this list that jumps out. Uh, you had Bersano starting in that obviously Tarek Tarek was paired with Kip Keller. Then our fullback pairings, uh, Lundquist on the left, John Gallagher on the right. Um, Alex ring was in this lineup again. Uh, again, mm-hmm. I, I believe we saw this weekend before last against Louisville was the same sort of like this team came on second and the teams that subbed in against Sacramento, that was the first team, out there at Verde Hill. Um, so seeing Alex Ring here, there was some conversation, not just, I think it was less so against um, Sacramento here. And jumping ahead a little bit to Miami, when we saw that lineup come out, that that the group that came on second against Sacramento was the group that started against Miami this past Saturday. And there's a couple other guys that there's conversation about their, their roles, uh, particularly at those fullback positions, but seeing Alex ring continue to come off the bench here. Mm-hmm. There's been a lot of talk about, is he going to be the captain again? But do you, th- do you think there's a chance that he has maybe not lost his spot, but that Wolf sees him more as a fit off the bench, at least coming into the season. Cause it's, it's a little bit perplexing to me again. Maybe I'm a little bit higher on Alex ring than the general fan base, but what's your thought about ring kind of being the captain but of this second unit lately, it is starting to get interesting, um, especially seeing how well Owen's been playing. Um, it is. I am not getting concerned because it's not necessarily a bad problem. I would say to have you know a younger guy who can really contribute, mm-hmm. um, particularly a little bit more offensively than Alex can. Um, 
if he loses the captaincy, um, I don't know if I see him starting then. Yeah. I really don't. Um, yeah. And again, he's he you know he's thirty one. We know who he is as a player. Mm-hmm. We know we're we're gonna get from Alex Ring. We're gonna get maximum effort. We're gonna get a leader. We're gonna get a guy who is you know very committed on the defensive side of the ball, willing to track back, do the dirty things that we need to do in order to you know win out some win some games and and you know important matches during this MLS season. Mm-hmm. Um, but I don't know if the writing's on the wall with him quite yet. Um, but you see that there's, there is definitely a definitive first and second team kind of operating here. And we're trying to build some chemistry and cohesion with these units. And he has firmly been planted with this other unit here. Um, So it's going to be interesting on Saturday when we see what this, you know, official 11 is. And right now, you know, I am a betting man. You are also a betting man. (laughs) I don't think I would touch any sort of, does Alex ring start prop or anything along those lines? Right. Because right. it's really just an unknown at this point with how this preseason has gone. And, you know, we're still getting our bearings trying to figure out how to accurately characterize and judge how these preseason games are played. Cause obviously this is the first time we've paid this much, you know, attention to it and been able to scrutinize it to a point where we're looking at, you know, our captain, of last year potentially not being in our lineup apologize for the mooch dog there um, <laughs> it's not a it's not a north end episode without mooch appearing or Wimby, one of the two dogs yeah i uh when hernan's dog barked during the best ball draft i felt really great yeah, I was like, <laughs> yeah all right yeah. good man like everyone everyone's dealing with this shit yeah <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah I, I mean i think you're spot on there and that's a, like again our, our hesitancy, if there was a, a prop on Alex Ring starting or not, like I think that's that's the best way you and I, as as, as the gambling men we are, can, can put it right now. There's just uncertainty there in the defensive midfield about how we are entering this season, again, with, with multiple competitions right off the bat, with mm-hmm. CCL starting there after the second regular season match. And in the second unit, too, with Owen Wolf being in that first unit over the last week, it's very defensive because you've got Ring in there. Sophie yep. Jeffels in there. Johan yep. Valencia is, is back, and, and he got the start here against Sacramento. Um, so, again, it's, 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 it would be a question more for people who got to watch that match all the way through, I guess, on which one of those guys. I imagine Ring was going a little bit further forward, but Jeff will, I think Valencia is the one we know is yeah. staying in, in the more defensive position, but – Interesting to see if, if maybe Ring is going to continue to get uh, further forward as he did last year, especially in the first half of the year. Or if Jeffel is a guy that, again, we haven't seen a ton of him yet, but a lot of good reviews from his teammates, good reviews from the D.C. fans mm-hmm. uh, who were not happy to see him go in the offseason. So just something to watch here. Uh, and it, it, yeah. it's a good problem to have, right, sure. to have a bunch of, of acceptable choices in the midfield. Um, For sure. And, I mean, the the – Look, the Owen Wolf situation is a challenging one in itself mm-hmm. because it's like, you know, you're always going to have that contingency of the fan base who are just saying he's being propped up because his dad's the coach. Right. You know, and that can work kind of both ways where it's like, does this dude actually really deserve playing time? And, you know, there's this, you know, we're, we're all human. Josh is mm-hmm. human. He, mm-hmm. he can, you know, understand that people see nepotism all the time. Not that this is a case of it, obviously Owen very deserving. Um, But to, you know, it it can also be a drawback when you're like, all right, well, he definitely deserves his playing time, but are we going to get some backlash if things don't go well? And it's like, Oh, well, we're playing the coach's son, you know, we got the coach's kid in all the time. And that's why we're losing because it's an easy kind of out. You don't have to really, you don't really have to break down the game and and see what the, you know, the the actual faults of the match were, were. Mm -hmm. you can just kind of point to that. Um, but again, a good problem to have, um, all of those guys have a defensive mindset. Um, it just seems that Danny and Owen also possess a bit more of a nose for the ball on the offensive side. Sure. Um, obviously we saw a couple of rips from Johan last year, which is super encouraging <laughs> yeah. and exciting. And I would like to see that again. And I, I know we will. Um, 
But again, a good problem to have. And, uh, you know, our, the, the defensive prowess of our midfield is, is pretty awesome. Yeah. And then, you know, Ronnie Redis got the start, Ethan Finley, Maxi Aruti up top. So after seeing Maxi kind of just play those extra half hour periods at the mm-hmm. two matches at Verde Hill to see him get the start and get not the full 90, but into the second half, well into the second half, I think before Josh made kind of the wholesale subs there. Um, mm-hmm. Good to see Aruti getting more of a realistic run out. Um, you know, yeah, it, it seems like they were that. Yeah. No, yeah. no, for sure. Um, so then I believe what happened again, we didn't, we actually got eyes on the match while we were out at the kit release party. One of our good buddies slid a little link in there. So we, we watched about, I don't know, 25, 30 minutes of the match as best we could with the, the cell service that was, that was down there, but we had already missed the Sacramento Republic goal, which reportedly came off a, what has been described, I, I'll put it nicely, a poor giveaway by Johan Valencia who then compounded his mistake by uh, giving up the PK, which Sacramento converted. We've seen uh, Johan Valencia have some questionable decision-making and and those leading to fouls. And and I certainly, we didn't at the time. I'm not going to go and revise my thought on it, but he, you know, his handball gave up the PK in the first playoff game against RSL. Mm -hmm. That I don't hold, I don't think he could do much about a ball just coming at him and it hitting his, his arm, but yeah, the 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 decision making. We know he is the most yellow card prone, I believe, on the team in terms of like a per ninety on a per sure. ninety basis. I mean, the guy was suspended for I think with only one start, got suspended for yellow card accumulation in like yeah. his tenth game. So, um, I guess I, I'm I'm still it's not a, a huge concern, but like overall, right? But still, just individually, you would you would like to see Valencia as we move through all of these competitions this season, be able to continue to acclimate himself to the way that the PRO officials call the game, because obviously from where he came from, it was a much more physical game where he was allowed to get away with more in the defensive midfield where the officials are not taking kindly to the way he's been, been that physical so far in his MLS tenure. Absolutely. I mean, he's a physical aggressive kind of player by nature. Um, and the acclimation process of him, you know, really getting fully immersed in how MLS games are being refed in mm-hmm. comparison to where he, you know, used to play. Um, I would, I, I also would like to see, uh, you know, a, a bit more of a, an upward trending positive, um, you know, uh, situation with him mm-hmm. in, in that regard. Uh, at this point, yes, he's got to learn. He has to learn that this is just unacceptable and hurts the team. And so, again, down down one nil there um, through halftime and into the deep second half. At halftime, there was only one change for the Verde and Black. Uh, John Gallagher came out. Hector Jimenez came in. So, obviously, we had been discussing the prospects of Hector maybe getting some midfield minutes there on, on the left, like we saw against Louisville, but came in in his fullback position here at the right back uh, to start the second half against Sacramento. Uh, And then one more change in the 61st, we did see Danny Pereira come on for Johan Valencia. Um, And then it was the 74th minute E where we saw kind of the full squad rotation uh, with the exception of Danny, who had just come on 13 minutes prior. So Hector got about 30 minutes in there. Um, So we closed it out. Danny stayed in there. Uh, Will Bruin, Zan Kolmanich, Rigoni, Fagundes, Cascante, Lima, Vicenin, Wolf, Andreusi came on to finish out the match in the 74th minute. And then you and I, uh, still at the kit release party, I think we had closed the stream by this point, but when the club tweeted out uh, the goal and then the video, uh, we're getting our hopes up for our for our sixth round best ball pick, Emiliano <laughs> Rigoni, who equalized uh, in the, what was it, 88? 86th minute off a Zan Kolmanich cross from the left there. And uh, the first time we've seen Rigoni put the ball in the net, albeit it's still in preseason, it doesn't count yet, but the Verde and Black fans seem to to love it. We obviously loved it. Uh, And the first goal scored in the Las Vosas kit. So uh, I guess (laughs) obviously both of us were excited, but how are you feeling about Rigoni after that first goal? And I guess we can kind of look ahead. He scored again on Saturday against Miami. So we've yeah. got in the last week, or it was, a, I guess, an eight-day span through three preseason matches, 
two goals for Emiliano Rigoni and an assist. Correct. I mean, he's he, we talk about Rigoni with Tom Bogart a little bit later. I, I think we are, and I don't, I don't think we're alone. We're getting a little bit more excited for Rigoni here now that we're seeing him produce this close to the season. Yeah, I mean, if you uh, took down the biggest Rigoni supporters in the world, <laughs> you and I would be uh, we we would be in the top five believers. Yeah, for sure. Now the Boger conversation that's interesting because I I guess I picked up on a bit more of the the pessimist pessimistic side that he oh, had. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, and look, we know, you know, Reina's on uh, record saying we expect double digit goal production mm-hmm. from our DPS. Mm-hmm. Um, so, you know, Ragoni has been put on notice. Yeah. Uh, he needs to score some goals. He needs to contribute. The The cross from Zani in that game was beautiful and a mm-hmm. great finish. And obviously, this is looking good um, in regard to his performance over the last week or so. Um, and hopefully it translates into the regular season because, you know, obviously our investment in best ball uh, takes a back seat. <laughs> to the success of the club of course Um, and he is going to have to score some goals for us this year um and he will have plenty of opportunities to do so he will also have plenty of very talented offensive players to get the ball to to Mm -hmm. potentially get some assists um but he has looked good it's promising and um you know Bogart touches on it uh, a little bit here and uh, i think it's good insight for people um, you know, who have questions about Rigoni going into this season. Sure. Well, I think the goals to, for me at least, are the bigger relief because we said constantly through his few appearances that he made last year that the service was there. He made so many passes that were threatening. And so I think the assists for me are less of a concern than him being able to put the ball in the back of the net. And two preseason matches in a row uh, certainly can't ask for much more out of him at this point and hopefully it carries on to when the games count um absolutely so uh again getting to that saturday match we did see kind of what we think that first team at the moment is a start against enter miami um stuver in net backline uh kolmanich cascante vicenin and lima and we saw danny pereira and owen wolf paired there in the defensive midfield with driusi Ragoni, fagundes and zardis in the attack um, this one, uh, kind of a slow start. I think it was nil, nil at the half. Um, mm. but from, and I, there was a lot and I'll shout out Tim Thompson on Twitter. He was doing a great job of kind of picking up the crumbs for us as I was out, I'm out here on vacation and, and we're, you know, it's a Saturday and yeah, uh, the sixth preseason game, et cetera. So he was kind of, uh, taking screenshots of the Miami beat writers and reporters that were at the stadium. And that was the way we were getting a lot of the play-by-play and the consensus from the Miami reporters, as biased as they may be, was that Miami was the aggressor throughout the first half and and should have had at least one goal on the board. And I saw multiple tweets from reporters out there talking about Stuber making great saves. So it sounds like Brad is out there in in mid-season form already. And you love to hear that ahead of this Saturday. Um, but Austin ends up getting on the board first, uh, right after halftime, 53rd minute. Um, Rigoni gets out, and this is the second Rigoni goal here of the week, uh, gets out ahead of the pack, just kind of a breakaway goal, calm finish uh, in yep. the 53rd minute to put us ahead. And then uh, I think Miami doesn't just pull one back fairly quickly, but actually scores a second. I think the second goal was Rodolfo Pizarro. So Austin falling behind. 2-1 there, kind of just in the, the middle of the, the second half, 78th minute. We mm-hmm. saw, all right, I'm getting ahead of myself here. We did see Kip come in for Julio in the 61st minute. And I think we can go ahead and talk <laughs> about this. I think this was because of the injury. And uh, right. and they actually, the, there's video out there that Julio posted. Um, Julio kind of heads a ball trying to clear it. Stuver comes out to catch it and Julio falls down and Stuver cleats the shit out of his head. Um, oh, yeah, and it looked, obviously, you saw the picture, if anybody hasn't seen it. If you're squeamish, avoid it. Um, yeah, but nice. if not, you can see how gnarly this gash is on Julio's head. Um, obviously, he seems to be in good spirits, but he can't, I don't think he can play this weekend. I, I mean, he's going to have staples in his head. 
Yeah. That, like he's going to be patched up for sure. I don't know. I don't, I mean, I don't if anybody's using way. their head. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> um, and I mean, also I do want to point out, right. That right after Kip came in, we conceded the two goals. That's a good point. So Julio comes out with the injury and then mm-hmm. they get on the board twice in a 15 minute span. Something like that. Yeah. 12 minutes, something like that. So that's concerning uh, for sure. And obviously we're, that is where we are thinnest. That is where we are weakest. Um, and Julio has, he's look with Gabriel, Gabrielson gone. Now he is our staple back there. He is kind of our rock, which is uh, a little shaky, but, um, you know, <laughs> at least that's how it feels. Right. Cause it, feel yeah. like, it feels like we've always like, it's been so easy to pick on Julio with if, if a ball goes through somebody's legs, it's, it's the obvious guy to kind of clown or blame in the back. And he's always mm-hmm. had this, for lack of a better term, a rock next to him, whether it was Matt Beasler or Ruben last year. And, you know, Leo, although we think he can and, and hopefully will be that he's younger. Yeah. And so yeah. like, I, it's just, I, I, <laughs> Obviously, we're still confident about this match against St. Louis, and we'll talk about that preview later on this week. But the back line is is clearly where we're most nervous about. Mm-hmm. And now to to go into the season, not, obviously, once that heals, he'll be fine. But to not have him in this opening match, it's, it makes me feel a little bit less confident. Yeah, no, it's not great by by any means. Um, and hopefully, Kippy can step in and and be serviceable and and get the job done. I, I mean, I, I'm still confident in our opening match here, but, yeah. you know, if, if there was one person that, you know, outside of Seba that we would be super, you know, bummed about missing this first game here, Julio's on the short list. Mm-hmm. So 78th minute, some more substitutions. Uh, Tarek comes in for Vicenin. Um Alex Ring came on for Fagundes, and then Finley came on for Rigoni. Um, and then in the 86th minute, uh, another – player who had not been on the score sheet yet for Austin FC during his tenure here, but has now two goals in the 2023 preseason Lobito with the absolute fucking banger. Did you see the replay of that goal? I did not. Oh my God. I'm going to send it to you here in a second, but okay. It looked, it was, there was multiple people that tweeted something to the effect of Owen has been learning from Seba. It was a, Great goal. Um, so I'll, I'll shoot that to you here in a minute. Um, so game finishes 2-2 there. Yep. Uh, and thus wrapping up the 2023 preseason here. Six matches, uh, three against MLS sides, three against the USL sides. Uh, two wins and a draw against the USL sides. One draw and two losses against MLS teams. But again, it's preseason. Those two losses against MLS sides came much earlier in the preseason. Um mm-hmm. So I don't think we're, you know, it's kind of, if we went undefeated in the preseason, we'd be strutting around a little bit. And since we didn't, I'm yeah. just going to say it's preseason. And I think we'll just brush it off. Okay. I like that approach. <laughs> <laughs> so um, next business day segment, this, at least today, I don't think we have a ton to talk about because we did get the, uh, you know, pictures on Instagram, on Twitter from the FC2 players uh, going out there to play against Florida international on the same Mm -hmm. day that the first team played uh, inter Miami. But from what I could find Twitter, Instagram, from any players from uh, uh, the club, right? The FC two accounts, even I went, I went digging on Florida international site. Like I couldn't find anything about this match. So we don't have much to talk about other than I did see David Rodriguez post an Instagram story bowling, with Cristo Vela and uh, oh. Cristo Vela doesn't look like much of a bowler. So we're glad that he is here <laughs> to play football. Um, so short and sweet last business day segment here, I guess, Ian, yeah. any, anything you have to add on that? If I'm, let me look, pull up the schedule here. Um, Houston Christian is the matchup coming up this weekend. Um, okay. And that will be on Sunday. So I'm, I, let me see if this, they have, Interesting. yeah. And that's a home match. So, okay. We do obviously want to cover FC2 to the best of our ability, but as a game that is probably taking place the morning after the mm-hmm. opener here this weekend, I don't have confidence you and I are going to get out there to watch that one. You, we would be a, a pretty heavy questionable. 
Yeah. <laughs> I think <laughs> that angry. is fair enough. <laughs> um, so I guess a couple other things here before we get to Tom. Mm. Uh, kit release was this past week. Obviously, the man, shout out to the media team. I can't imagine how frustrating it was to have the European Adidas site leak these kits mere hours before they, you know, and they have the the, the hype videos planned. You got the yeah. kit release party planned, and it just comes out at, in the middle of the night because it's on the website over there in Europe. Um, yeah. I guess what... What are your thoughts on the kit now that we see it and it's not a blurry picture floating around on the internet? Um, people calling it the barcode kit. Mm -mm. I think it, it seems like to me, at least through the two kit releases we've been through with Sentimiento and now Las Voces, I think everybody's going to hate anything that they put out. And then 100%. people will come on board slowly as they realize they're just being stubborn. 100%. I, I mean, I, it's going to go like this for eternity with these kids. <laughs> you're going to have a large group of people who are like, Oh, these are the most hideous things I've ever seen. Mm -hmm. I'll wait for them to go on sale. You know, I'll, I'll get them when they're discounted or whatever it may be. And I understand, you know, yeah. I, I get it. Um, so really all we can have is our, our own little personal opinion on these. Um, I don't hate them. Mm -hmm. They're not my favorite. Sure. Um, I did, I will say that when I saw them in person up close, I did like them much more, mm -hmm. um, than my, and we saw them on the screen, right? We saw them on the stream and we saw some pictures yep. that the club put out. So yep. they're very green on, on the screen. Green. Yeah. <laughs> uh, they're quite green. They'll be extra green with the green lights there in the stadium. Yeah. <laughs> um, so yeah, I mean, I, I, I am not indifferent. I mm -hmm. will also probably get one at some point here. Um, I know you got yours and you suffered a, a great tragedy. Oh my God. With it. Um, this bastard Wimby, man. <laughs> Brian tells me after the fact, he goes, I should have told you, you got to take your kid off before you go in the house. And uh, <laughs> yeah, pulled the thread out. $165. That's a $165 thread. Yeah. That, my, that was a perfect pull dog. too. Just yeah. Right, right, right down the front. The, right, down, right across <laughs> the middle of the kit there. Um, so yeah, I mean, you know, I, I will grab one. They're 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 plenty fine. Yeah. Uh, having looked at the entire rest of the league, they are above average for me sure. for sure. Like if people can, you know, get a get a good look at the rest of the kits that came out, mm -hmm. I think they'll probably feel a little better about ours. What are some? I guess just real quick. What mm -hmm. are some of your favorites from the other teams that you saw? Because we were, you and I were kind of going through all of them together, and I know that yeah. I think we each kind of have some some favorites. Uh, I mean, the the first one that I was drawn to was the Minnesota one. Um, mm -hmm. I liked the uh, the color scheme there. I, I think I think that they one... call that the Northern Lights kit. I think. Oh, nice. Yeah. yeah. Okay. I like that. Um, the Seattle one is super cool. Yeah, that's my favorite, um, what a, I think. Yeah, what a concept for that one um, to go that route. I thought that was great. Um, this uh, <laughs> this Toronto one, not that's my disgusting. favorite for yeah. sure. <laughs> um, I'm actually having a bit of a difficult time seeing this. Uh, the uh, oh, the the Galaxy one is uh, another one mm -hmm. that I know that that we were a fan of. Big big fan of the color scheme there. Um, but again, you know, the Austin FC kit is. Far, far from the worst kit that came out there. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I think I'm I'm right there with you, and I think I second everything. You like the the Seattle Bruce Lee kit? I think is my definitive favorite with the dragon, yeah. the yin yang on the back of the neck. Um, I do like that LA Galaxy kit as well. I think what I saw was that the Galaxy kit is based on the like the the city flag for Los Angeles. So that's okay. that's kind of cool. Um, and then the the Johnny Cash kit, the all black for Nashville. Oh yeah, I'm a big fan of that. I think that's really yes. slick. That is slick. And the the little Cash, uh, the little Johnny salute there at the at the bottom of the kit is a is a really nice yeah. touch that you yeah. really wouldn't be able to see unless you see it up close or like are trying to buy the Nashville kit. Yeah. <laughs> if so, you're an Austin FC fan, you better not be. Yeah, <laughs> I guess the the, the last <laughs> friendly thing we'll say about Nashville this season um mm -hmm. last piece of austin fc thing here, stuff here and this is a little bit selfish but we have to mention on the pod we dude 
we sat down to watch the Rooted in Austin. Uh, oh, you know the little docu series episode two came out, and you know I'm, we sit down. We try to we're going <laughs> to try to get some crumbs and get you know get some content out of all the good stuff that the media team puts out. And I did a fucking double take, man. <laughs> Oh my god! If anybody doesn't know what we're talking about. You go watch the Rudin and Austin episode. They put for some reason they decided that, that to put our voices over the first like 20, 25 seconds of that video talking about Leo Weissman's arrival and just we don't have to talk much about it. I just wanted to say thanks to the media team, whichever one of them is listening and and thought to do that. That was super cool for us. We were pumped. Yeah, I called you. <laughs> it's yeah. like man, look, go watch the video. Yeah. Um, so we were really hyped about that, and just to be included in any content, much less a rooted episode. Like for we sure. love those, even our group chat. Like we, when those come out, we all watch them. Yeah. And so for us to be included in that was just fucking awesome. Absolutely incredible. The roller coaster of emotions that I went on uh, <laughs> before and then after that. Uh, I'll give the short and quick yeah, yeah. version. I left my <laughs> phone in the back of a lift. Mm. Um. So I didn't have my phone. Obviously, I can't log into my Lyft to be like, hey, I left my phone in the back of this dude's car. Like, what can I do? So for 40 minutes, I'm trying to figure out how to get my phone back. I submit all kinds of complaints with Lyft, trying to log into my phone remotely (laughs) from my buddy's phone in order to turn the location on. And then after about 50 minutes, I'm like, oh, shit, my brother must have my location on back in New York. Mm -hmm. I call him on my buddy's phone. We triangulate the position. We're live tracking this Uber man driving (laughs) throughout Austin. We hop in my buddy's truck and we're just chasing him, you know, around. (laughs) Uh, So finally get to it. This man's house apartment, knock on the door. I'm like, this is, I might get shot. This is terrible. (laughs) Uh, But he had my phone, gave it back. And then right away you called me. Yeah. Oh, right. Was it like literally like, Pretty much right away. It was the first, like, it was like the first communication I had got outside of me, like letting my brother know I had gotten my phone back. Um, And you're like, oh man, you know, you got to go watch the the, the Rooted episode. And I was like, all right, like I will, you know? (laughs) And uh, yeah, just, uh, I was like, oh, hey, hey, that's Zach. (laughs) Hey, that's me. (laughs) So yeah, um, thank you uh, to the media team for a really uh, special moment for you and I, and, yeah. um, uh, just a roller coaster of emotions that day that, that ended with a, a great high there. <laughs> hey, and, and including one of your, uh, one of your best words that you've used, I think through 31 episodes here. So you're right. saying assuage. That's right. It's, uh, man, you're picking your game up, man. I'll say, I'll say that and yeah. they, the media team clearly recognized it. Clearly <laughs> <laughs> a couple other news items here before we get to Bogart. Um, some U.S. Open Cup updates came out. Obviously, the MLS team's not seeded yet or, or, you know, paired yet, I guess I should say. But the second round pairings are finalized now. A couple not- notables there. El Paso Locomotive. You know, we, we like our USL Texas teams here. They will take on Union Omaha in the second round. Um, Detroit City FC will take on their city rivals there. Gold Star Detroit. Detroit City FC, I just I, I really enjoyed kind of learning about their club during the Open Cup last year. They were one of the many USL sides that took down an MLS club. Uh, their mm-hmm. fans are great. So that's one I got my eyes on. Um, Louisville City, who we saw a few weeks back, will take on Lexington Sporting Club. The Pittsburgh Riverhounds, who yeah, I actually drove past their stadium yesterday. It's kind of on oh. the south side of Pittsburgh. Great view of the downtown. I I actually – I. We're here a week before the season starts, so I won't get to go to a match there. But that is one that that I would definitely love to go take in a match there on the south side of Pittsburgh. Yeah, um, that'd be awesome. They actually that match actually might not happen because uh, Rochester New York FC, which is the one next pro team here in the second round, mm-hmm. uh, some weird stuff going on there. We don't have to go into it, but anybody who's interested in like what's going on with Rochester, it's kind of a one of a. Uh, obviously a lower division side, but kind of a storied history there with that club. It doesn't, they might not have a season with yeah. Players have left and there's a lot of confusion going on there with the Rochester club. So just, just wanted to mention that, Mm. um, you know, we have some ties with Charlie Asensio and uh, the like, and the Charleston battery who will take on the Savannah Clovers. So again, this is just our one time every year that we get to get into some, you know, we learn about some of these lower division teams 
around the country. And so I, I'm looking forward to that. And I'll probably catch some of these these lower division sides. I believe this second round still a ways away. These matches, uh, I believe, will take place between March 21st and 23rd. Uh, mm-hmm. So about a month away from, from this second round happening. And then obviously we are in the fourth round. But that third round, that's when the MLS, the majority of the MLS teams start to come in. So we'll talk Open Cup yeah. when that comes around it's gonna in be about fun. a month. Uh, quick hits here on some of the MLS news. Uh, Sergio Cordova, we mentioned, uh, was nearing a deal uh, to join the Whitecaps. He has now officially joined Vancouver as a DP after the transfer from FC Augsburg. The fee was around $2 million. Vancouver also sent up to 200k or 300k excuse me in gam 200 guaranteed 100 in add-ons to rsl for cordova's uh, mls rights and they mm-hmm. also sent along their 2024 first round pick um which with the parody in mls that could be a really valuable draft selection so um yeah. that was a, a a significant transaction this week some galaxy news here as well uh and this one we didn't we we berated Tom with a ton of questions on a various, uh, a lot of subjects. And so I yeah. didn't want to have to dive into the Araujo saga, but Tom reported earlier this week that Julian Araujo is now a member of FC Barcelona. I don't yeah. know what happened there between FIFA and the two leagues and the two clubs, but mm-hmm. obviously we said before, we're both happy that he, um, that he would still, he seemed to have the chance to still join them in the summer and now just join them here in the spring. Um, yeah. So that's good, obviously, for the league, good for him and, and you know, took a took a, a spot out of the depth chart on the Galaxy. But in turn, obviously, the Galaxy don't wait around long. Um, they have come to an agreement with and this is I will butcher this pronunciation, have to get one in uh, Flum- Fluminense. Um, I believe that's a Brazilian club. Uh, they have a deal in place for right back. Lucas Caligari. He's a 20 year old oh. that would join on loan with a purchase option, likely a U 22 initiative signing mm-hmm. for the galaxy there to, to bolster their right back depth chart again. Um, and again, 20 years old, he's got 46 appearances and 42 starts in four seasons with that team. Um, yeah. So again, starting in that, the Brazilian Serie A, or I don't know what they call it there. Serie yeah. A, the, the top division out there in Brazil at age 16, getting his professional start there. So, you know, another. it seems like good business there for the Galaxy, who obviously haven't had the best business yeah. of late. And then now we've got uh, Marcelo got bought out of his contract overseas, and the rumor is Marcelo coming to join the left-back depth chart there for the Galaxy. Um, so a lot of Galaxy news this yeah. week. Um, last one here, Matko Milahevich from Montreal underwent surgery and will be out 8 to 12 weeks. He was... Widely considered to be somebody who could take on the role and therefore the production of Georgi Mihailovic, who is obviously out of Montreal. So it, just another huge blow to a team that we already know was on the downswing. Yeah, um, was, couldn't afford to lose him. And so we do, you know, when we're going to do our, our, you know, we got to do our predictions uh, mm-hmm. later this week. Montreal certainly going to be at the bo- near the bottom of the East, I think, for both of us. Um, yeah, because now it's just gonna, that just makes their start here that much tougher. Um, but that I mean, that'll do it. We don't have to go into all the nitty gritty of the news here because we talked yeah. to Tom Bogert. Um, I mean, we asked this man for 15 minutes. He gave us a half hour and and was not pushing us to, you know, get him out. No hard out. So, like, really appreciate Tom. Um, mm-hmm. And I guess nothing else to say. Let's go ahead and talk to Tom Bogert. All right, everybody. We teased it all episode. We are sitting here uh with i guess you know ian we'll call him our good buddy now uh for many he's the fab romano of the mls but for us right he's the woge he's the Schefter, he's the shams of mls reporting it's tom bogert tom really appreciate you joining us man how you doing what's going on boys thank you for having me i appreciate it one quick correction you know you guys said we're, we're sitting here i'm standing standing desk not a brag just a fact just want to just want to make sure that that's out there for, for everybody yeah. at the island. Oh, no I'm, I'm good man i'm excited for this season to get started well i'm i'm on the road up here in pittsburgh as we discussed right before we started recording uh so i am not at my standing desk but i'm also <laughs> a standing desk man so uh that is definitely not the only thing that us three here on the screen have in common you've described yourself as not exactly big enough fast enough or skilled enough 
to go pro and also said that you're an average white guy. I think all of those things <laughs> apply to us. All of us played in college, although we played we played basketball. We were not soccer nice. guys. So we are kind of self-described uh, uh, new soccer diehards here with Austin <laughs> FC over the last few years. Um, wanted to talk a little bit about your, your college career before <laughs> we got into, you know, some of the MLS, the Austin FC stuff. You played at Kane University for three seasons, five games as a freshman, 20 games your sophomore year with nine starts, nine games as a junior, got on the score sheet then twice and an assist. Um, how did how did you get to Kane? What was your experience like there as a small college player? Because uh, Ian and I both played Division II hoops. Um, nice. I uh, I coached at the Division three level for the last right. seven years. So we're small college guys. So <laughs> I guess how did you get there? What was your experience like as a, as a Kane footballer? First of all, I can't tell you that the very few amount of people who pronounce that correctly because it it reads like keen. So like yeah. a, a good, good homework. Well done. Uh, yeah. So I'm born and raised in New Jersey. I was, you know, doing the recruiting stuff there. I had a couple options, but kind of, I, I liked the option of Kane. I, I liked it being near New York city. Cause I'm more of like, um, urban rather than like kind of middle of nowhere. Like I had some other options, but like this, this one made the most sense. UMass was, was another one. i probably wouldn't have played at all <laughs> you know they were again d when they were very very good i i think i could have made the team i don't think i would have made much of an impact um but yeah so kane for all those reasons and it ended up being one of the best decisions i made like if i didn't if i wasn't near new york city like that helped with internships and that got the ball rolling for a lot of things so yeah i'm very very glad and and you know i'm gonna sound like a homer but like bro our conference like new jersey soccer is really really good our conference yeah. at any given time had four or five teams ranked in the top 25. Like, so it was like really good soccer. There's a, a ton of really good players right here. So the, the quality was good. Not again, not quite like ACC D1 or anything like that. So don't, <laughs> don't get me twisted. But uh, yeah, yeah it, was, it was a lot of fun. It was really competitive. Well, I know from the basketball side of things in Division Three, there's a little bit of bias to those East Coast teams. Some good <laughs> hoops down in Texas. I've, soccer, probably the Northeast, has got us beat. But, yeah. um, you know, you mentioned some of the internships you did. I know you've said you were uh, with CBS, SNY, when you were, I, I think, particularly your senior year mm -hmm. when you didn't play. Um, yeah. And what were why. some of the what were some of the best things that you took out of those internships that led you to the position that you were in now? And I guess as an aside, you also covered some high school football up there while you were interning. So did I when I was interning at the MVC affiliate Classic, right. down here in Austin. Um, you don't have to do your own box scores down here, Tom. My um, God, that was <laughs> that was that was humbling. That was good. And a, a quick joke of why it was good that I, I got into soccer and not football. I had Kenny Pickett twice. And I was like, oh, this kid's pretty good. I think the first, like, they they like just killed some team, like, the first game. And I was, yeah. you know, 20 years old or whatever, trying to, you know, write a really great game score. <laughs> the box was like, oh, what's the story here? Not the star quarterback who scored four touchdowns. It's the offensive line. And that's what I did. And, like, that's – and I remember I watched them again. They lost. And I was like, yeah, like, this kid's pretty good. Like, he'll probably go play in college. It's like, oh, somebody told me he committed to Pitt. That's cool. He probably won't play. <laughs> And then, yeah. <laughs> you know, started for what felt like nine years and then uh, first round NFL draft pick. So don't don't come to me for football evaluation. <laughs> uh, but, yeah, I think that the biggest overarching thing that I learned from some of those internships is just being flexible. And like, again, like I got I didn't I did TV production for SNY. I did what writing for them. I did writing for um, CBS, but like a lot of other little things. And, and just in sports media, there's just so many things. And, and there's. There is no one path. Anytime people ask me for advice, like the best I can give you is there is no one path. And, you know, you just kind of have an open mind, but also know what you want. So I think with those internships, I learned a lot of different things uh, for SNY, like because both of those places kept me on like freelancing. I was a lot of the times doing the, the bottom line, like the ticker, I'm like that mm -hmm. was pretty cool. And like now yeah. I have an appreciation for that, like when I see it. And, you know, so, yeah, like uh, a lot of those things are really cool. I was very lucky to have those opportunities and that they liked me enough that they kept me around. Yeah, yeah, that that's awesome, man. I had some ticker experience there at KXAN as well nice. on Friday nights, and I I had a, a Baker Mayfield game at it, like Travis, which it wasn't just the Baker Mayfield game for me. The if you remember the uh, official strike in the NFL, the yeah. officiating crew, the head official from that Seattle Green Bay game, yeah. was actually doing that Lake Travis game when oh I was there God. that night. <laughs> they they weren't much better in that game. Tom. <laughs> um, <laughs> So a, a couple more things here before we get into the, the real soccer, you know, meat and potatoes here. Um, 
I know your favorite show in college was Breaking Bad. Now it's yep. The Wire, right? Yep. Uh, and you're you're a hoops guy too, so I can't pass. We can't pass up the opportunity to top hoops, talk hoops with Tommy Scoops. I had to say that. I'm sorry. My <laughs> Twitter my Twitter handle is Koizenberg. So again, you and I have a lot of, <laughs> a lot of similar interests here. Uh, we can we can skip over any Breaking Bad questions, but uh, we did want to talk uh, some Knicks. And Ian, I'll toss it to him for this because Ian hmm. is actually a native New Yorker All right. um, from the Albany area. So, e, if you had any, I know you had some hoops questions for Tom. Well, we got to figure out your favorite Knicks fight for sure. Yeah. <laughs> um, is it uh, Van Gundy being you know dragged? Yeah, uh, Van, Van Gundy Alonzo being an morning. ankle bracelet on Alonzo Morning. <laughs> I think that that's just iconic. I'm just oh. you know, anytime that Patrick Ewing got in the mix or like Oakley, like that's that, like that's even a little bit before my time. <laughs> um, the closest thing I think to a Knicks fight in my time was, I think the year before the Knicks got, that was a couple years before the Knicks got Carmelo Anthony and when he sucker punched somebody and got suspended for 15 yeah. games. <laughs> oh, that's right. But well, oh. he was on the Nuggets though, but I, yes, the other way. Yeah. Well, uh, were you uh, a big Knicks fan for the Chris Childs Kobe fight? Cause that was, I was, that was time. I was probably like five or six. So like, I don't have like good recollection of it. So, okay. Yeah. Yeah, I was, you know, I, the, the lean years of when they were, you know, Stephon Marbury in bed and dumping assets to for the LeBron James free agency that ended up with Mark <laughs> Stoudemire. But yeah, the hey, dude, the, the 2012 13 Carmelo season is like still one of my favorite sports moments ever. Like that team didn't do anything. We won one labor <laughs> yeah. through one playoff series. The Roy Hibbert block lived rent free in my, in my brain still, but like oh. that was so much fun, that team. That team was fun. JR, all that. Oh, my God. Yeah, that was a good little squad. Now, this is not NBA-related. Uh, just an off chance kind of shot in the dark. Because you played soccer in New Jersey, um, I came up with the uh, Alley Cats organization. Any okay. familiarity with them in no. tournaments on the Northeast? No? No. Okay. <laughs> the only other question I have for you, basketball-wise, Tom, is thoughts on the Josh Hart trade. Shouldn't this guy be starting if you're dumping a first-rounder for him? Well, the the first it's a first round if they miss the playoffs or it gets mm-hmm. conveyed as like four second round picks. So yeah, I don't know. I'm anyway. I'm juiced about that signing. It's like it was tough timing for me. I I have only been able to catch highlights because the deadline, the trade deadline was last Thursday. Wednesday mm-hmm. night, I flew to London. So right. obviously, right. I wasn't watching any basketball at, at one a.m. in London. So yeah. then I got back Wednesday night, Thursday morning. So like. But then it's the all-star break. So like I, I haven't gotten a chance to appreciate it. I was like, look at the box, like his debut or whatever game it was that he had he poured it up with like 27 or something. I was like, oh yeah. shit, like let's go. Yeah. yeah I he think went, he went off. He was cursing <laughs> talking shit about Brooklyn. Like yeah. he really went wild. I'm so mad I missed that game, dude. Oh yeah. so mad. I think both of us Josh Hart fans, one of the better rebounding uh wings yeah, for his is. position, to be wow. sure. Um so yeah, that'll be fun to watch. But appreciate you humoring humoring us through some some basketball talk there. No, um, come on, all that 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 was so yeah. well prepped. You have to appreciate it. <laughs> like, <laughs> hey, um, deep. Hey, that's what uh, I I do basketball content for a living. So I nice. I was juiced up for that one. But I'll say more and more about the the the, the first line of questioning about about the bio mm-hmm. and all that stuff. That was that was some good stuff. Hey. <laughs> we <laughs> try, man. I appreciate the kind words there. But uh, now we're going to try to drill into you a little about a, a little bit about some of the MLS stuff here because, again, we're uh, relatively new soccer diehards in general mm-hmm. and certainly getting used to MLS over the last two seasons. But I think one thing that bugs both of us as as new MLS fans is the complexity with the salary cap. Yeah. The inconsistency of statistics also gets us, uh, you know, particularly with the assists, right, between certain sites. And um, so I, I, I can make that easy for you. MLS okay. counts secondary assists, like hockey. Yes. Right. You no, know, like, right. uh, like transfer market, who scored, whatever, they don't. So yeah. they just do primary assists. I like there being more numbers. Like, I, I think it's, it's cool, but like again, I know I sound like a show and a homer, but like I, I do enjoy the secondaries. It is difficult though for me, like when I'm writing stuff, and like, all right, like stats, like got to do it from MLS, and it's like, oh, there's this signing that came from you know Denmark or England, and it's like, okay, so he had this many assists, but like he'll have even more in MLS, right? Because- <laughs> <laughs> right? Yeah, I think definitely. I mean, again, from our perspective, that I, I enjoy those hockey assists being mm-hmm. counted because they're usually really important to the buildup of of the mm-hmm. goal. So. Um, but I guess my the, the big question from us here is we're not the first person, far from the first people to say something like this, but Gam and Tam is not new user new user friendly. No, for lack of a better term. Do you think the league 
is maybe even moving in a direction or would ever consider moving to a more traditional salary cap where you can just buy and sell players without this monopoly money. Like, wouldn't that keep yes. some of the better players here, like Chicho? Yeah, I mean, th- but it still would have been advantageous for them if they did it for 2.5 or 3 million in allocation money. And I understand why sure. that's super confusing, but like, I don't think that that was the entire reason why he left the league. And like, I, I don't know, he's a six and a half million dollar player, whatever it was for, for Pachuca like that. He's legitimately guy. Like, I don't know who kind of would have been paying that in MLS, but Hey, mm. in general, yes, the league is trending that way. Like the athletic reported this. I heard this as early as last year that they were saying, Hey, like I, if there's a real possibility in 2023, they do, you know, real money transfers rather than allocation money that hasn't happened. But again, as the athletic reported, it was, it's trending in that direction. It's going to happen at some point. Uh, Tam is already being phased out. I forget exactly when that end date is, um, but you know, these things take a little bit of time. Um, and I don't know about Gam, but you're right. Like, it's not just that it's not new user friendly. It's all like, I have to guess which teams might have a lot of Gam. Mm-hmm. And like, this is what I do for a living. And there's a lot of times where I'm like, dude, I don't know. And so like, yeah. that's an issue. And I understand that. So I like it. Both of these concepts were important to try to push some boundaries and allow some teams like to spend a little bit more money and, you know, make it easier for to bring in significant players who weren't DPs. And that's another thing. I love the U22 initiative rule that it, it's been a way to get more young players that you don't have to, you know, you sign a 19 year old and if he doesn't hit and it's okay, it doesn't kill you. Like it would be for a DP. So I think that's helped. There are a lot of things that make sense in the time. And I do think that the league are taking kind of the right steps of continuing to evolve. I don't know how long it'll take just for us like straight up salary caps to come or if that ever will happen. But yeah, I think things are going the right way. Are we, yeah. are we the only league that has Cam Tam? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I'm yeah, trying to think of like, one. I, so and I, I've, I've talked to like a couple GMs about this and one in particular, like Likens is like allocation. He's like, just think of it more like draft picks in the NBA, right? Like that draft picks is the most like valuable, like trade asset or asset that, mm-hmm. you know, in transactions, like gam is that for us. So if you are able to stockpile a bunch of gam, that's really advantageous. And like, it's not a direct comparison, but it's one way to think of it because obviously draft picks here aren't as valuable or anywhere near as valuable just because of the nature of soccer and, how you acquire talent versus the NBA. The best way to do that is through the draft in terms of like young players and MLS. You can just go sign somebody or or have somebody through your Academy. So that like, that's kind of helped me look at it like, Oh, okay. Like that's just another asset is is the way you could look at it. Mm. Another thing that we're interested in revolving around kind of the mechanisms of MLS is just increasing the salary cap, especially with the Sportico report that came out about the sponsorship dollars between the five and a, it is five major American sports if you're looking yeah. at that chart because 100%. we're coming up on on the NHL's ass. I, I would think a, a year or two we could surpass yeah. them. Should the MLS be paying their players more? Like we certainly feel that they should be. Yeah, I mean, look, it's it, it, in a vacuum. Yeah, you'd say that about every league, but mm. like I don't know. And again, I don't I don't want to come off sounding like company lines or anything, but like, look, the Chinese Super League had all the money in the world, and they didn't have like the league like a lot of clubs kind of went under and a lot of clubs, like I understand why the league is cautious and they could probably be a little bit less cautious, but look, this league almost folded in 2002, 2005. Like yeah. those, we probably weren't like, I wasn't following the league at, close, at seven years old like that, but like people who are like those scars are real and those worries are real. So the way like to, to have the kind of controlled spending and like, I don't know, you look at Chelsea, like how's that sustainable, right? Like how is, how is it sustainable for teams to just spend insane amounts of money and, and lose money? It's, it's not a good business plan. It, it's why mm. MLS clubs are valued where they are because like it, it's a more like sustainable business model. And the idea is that it's going to keep growing with interest and, and more TV contracts continue to go up like everything else. But, you know, look, I, I don't know if I'd even be in favor of it going away at all. I think that mm. it can change. It can it can grow. It can be it could be easier for teams that if they want to put more discretionary spend into it, that there's kind of less um, guardrails for that. But mm-hmm. I, I, again, I see both sides, man. Like again, just the Chinese super league is, is, is comparable because of, again, they had even more money and they were spending more money like, and it didn't quite work out for them. So, I, you know, it uh, people smarter than me should probably be like breaking this down. I'm like, what the hell do I know about numbers and finances and, and long-term vi- viability for business plans. But like, while, while I do understand like the kind of concept of, yeah, just, screw it take off take off the guardrails take off whatever let teams do whatever they want like i, I do kind of see why it's it's necessary 
Mm. Yeah, I, I was about to say, I think this is your explanation is why Ian and I should not be in charge of, <laughs> of anything like that. Um, let's talk about some Austin FC stuff here. That's what that's what people are tuning in for, right? So not my D3 uh, college soccer career. <laughs> <laughs> so I think obviously absent trophies last year, everything outside of that, it was a dream season for yeah. all of us fans. And I think one of my current or I would say both of our biggest concerns for our fan base this year is if there's a, a few weeks where things are going south, that everybody loses their minds and we start hearing the wolf out cries again <laughs> and things like that. What are the realistic expectations that our fan base should have coming off that near a season that exceeded all of our expectations? Yeah, it's it, it like it, you're not. Un, it's it's not unreasonable to hope and expect for something like that. I think that they're in the that top tier in the West. It's it's going to be very fluid like any other MLS season. But you know, looking at it right now, it, it's them, LAFC, the Galaxy, maybe Seattle, depending on like health stuff. Portland, depending on how their center backs. But like that's where they should be talked about. And whether you finish first, second, third, or fourth, like anything that that isn't hosting a playoff game, it could be viewed as as um, a failure. Or, you know, below expectations, but. This team is going to be fun again. Like, I like Dryusi getting a new contract is awesome. I think Zardes was a, is an awesome signing. Like that dude's going to score twelve goals in his sleep if he starts twenty five yeah. games, which I think he will. And like he's he's not you know Maxi Rudy is one of the best defensive forwards in the league, but Zardes is very good as well on that. So it's like you kind of get um, the defensive work that you got from Rudy that was so valuable, while also being a proven goal scorer. Like again, like he it's since he got to Columbus in 2017, it's if he plays X amount of minutes, he will score X amount of goals. It's, mm. it's just a fact. So mm. I think that they're going to create a, a ton of chances for him because Josh Wolf does a lot of good things and, and they prioritize these things, even if it leaves them susceptible to counterattacks and stuff. Um, that, that, that's it. it. It's, it's if it's, if they can replace Gabrielson, like big shoes to fill with, with um, I'm, I'm blanking on how to yeah, pronounce Vicenin. Vicenin's yeah. name. Vicenin's name. Thank you. Uh, I, I didn't have any confidence there. You could hear me kind of Peter now. If Vicenin, like <laughs> Vicenin, that, that's, it's difficult to expect that because Gabrielson was very, very good last year, but Vicenin is, is at a stage of his career where he should be able to adapt a little bit quicker. And that's going to be the biggest thing that I'm watching because I have no, no questions about their attack, no questions about the midfield. It's really center backs. And as long as, as that doesn't even need to be hundred percent of what Gabrielson gave, like they're going to be one of the best teams in the West. Mm. Bang. Yeah. You're I think smart right now. Because <laughs> yeah. I mean, just like we we said, we said anything less than a home playoff game would be a bummer, right? We definitely said when Giassi got signed that he could score double digit goals, and I we definitely Easy. said in his Easy. sleep, <laughs> like he wasn't <laughs> we said in his sleep. Um, so yeah, wow, we're looking we're looking pretty smart right now. There was one more. I was going through the checklist mentally there. The last thing we said as well. Uh, uh, again, it's sounding too positive, dude. Like Ragoni. Rigoni has to be better. There was yeah. when that signing happened, there was nothing about his profile that screamed four million dollar transfer. He's mm -hmm. played for about four hundred teams, and everywhere he's been, he doesn't score very much. And mm -hmm. the idea is that he comes here and, and in this system, maybe he gets more box score numbers, air quote. But like four million dollar DP, it's got to be fifteen to eighteen goal contributions if you're playing. And he looked; it wasn't just the numbers; it was the eye test. It wasn't very good. And I like I'm cautious to not write dudes off. I'm I'm usually kind of the last, like, I'll give time. I'll give time. Like, I'll, mm -hmm. I'm coming into this with an open mind. But right. The first few months was were, were not great. And again, let him have a full off season. Let him see what it is. But going back to his past, this isn't abnormal. So I, I am worried about that. But again, even without him, the attack was great. So yeah, maybe true. it's not even a huge problem. And and we'll see how it goes. Because let's see what Owen Wolf can do. Like, I think yeah. that kid's legit. I hope yeah. he gets playing time. And if if Trayusi, I mean, if uh, if Rigoni isn't good, then Wolf's going to play, and Finley's going to play. Yeah, yeah, and uh, the, <laughs> Rigoni for a few reasons. Obviously, the fan base was frustrated to yeah. say the least with with his first few months last season. But uh, over the last three preseason games, and it is preseason, right? With two goals and an <laughs> assist. Look, but the hey, guys, man, so. it, they're still it's still good. It, it's better than not scoring in preseason, exactly. right? Like, you know? <laughs> exactly. The last week has certainly like we've seen a lot of people getting like. Okay, like maybe maybe we're gonna get uh, some DP quality production here from yeah. from the guy, and we we actually and I want to ask you about this in a little bit, but we did a best ball draft. I don't know if you're familiar with that style of fantasy sports, but uh, with some of the other podcasts here in the Austin FC community, we reached for Ragoni, drafted him in the sixth round. It was a four team <laughs> league, so we we reached. <laughs> so wow. yeah, we're definitely we're believers. Every 
everybody had to end up with an Austin FC player, of course. So we went ahead and we yeah, just so took Jose's got to be the first big. Yeah, he was he was yes. the 101. Um, <laughs> so I guess I, I got two more little questions about Austin. Um, you talked, to, you, you gave us a lot of praise, gave the team a lot of praise there. What's one thing the club can improve on in your mind? And I guess why is it probably U22 signings? Yeah, no, and, and again, these are these are difficult. You look around the league. Uh, NYCFC, that's kind of an unfair example because of their city football group. And they, they bought, they bought um, Montevideo Torque. And then mm. Tati Casianos isn't a DP and, and yeah. Santi Rodriguez is a U22 initiative player. Like, that's a little unfair. But, like, that's a team that's, that uses that mechanism really, really good. Like, it, it's really smart with a salary cap. If you can get dudes who are, like, contributing and they're hitting your cap at 200000 or even one fifty if they're if they're under 20, like, it's really it's really good. But again, on the other side, these are by nature, these are supposed to be high variant signings because not every single young player pans out. So yeah, like that's that's a spot. Um, and we'll see they have two filled right now. Three? Mm -hmm. No, two, yeah, three. Two. Well, Musa's out in, in League Un now, but yeah. yeah so, technically so I think he still, still counts because he's on loan. Yeah. But so maybe in the summer, they again, like if you hit on one of those, it's key. And like I I know Kalmanic like fell out last year. I was mm -hmm. impressed with him in his debut season, so maybe. He kind of bounces back this year. I don't think left back's a problem. They have a bunch of options now. Um, but yeah. but yeah, it, it's it'd probably be those U twenty two initiative signings. And before that, before they got Gabrielle, and it, it was you know central defense. Yeah, for sure. And the interesting thing too with the Ragoni success over the last week, Kolmanic has started I think four preseason matches in a row right. opposite Nick Lima on the right. So uh, with Lundqvist coming in and obviously John Gallagher having mm -hmm. a, a pretty a decent season for a converted fullback there last year, there's it's good to have the depth. For sure. Um, when are you coming to Austin for a match? Beers are I, on us, man. It's it's one of the, it's one of the ones that I, I want to go to the, the most. Like I still haven't like I've never, and it's it's it is tough for me that like put now particularly with how streamlined the schedule is. Like I need to watch as many games as I can. Yeah. So if I go to one game, that's all I'm seeing like that night for the most part. But yeah. honestly, Austin's at near the top of my list. Since he's somewhere I want to go, but Austin's probably tops because I've I've gotten to LA, I've gotten to Charlotte been to orlando it's like some of these like i haven't been to enough places but yeah mm -hmm. austin towards the top i gotta i gotta figure this out the predictions came out a day or two ago so i think the austin fans can probably put away the laminator here <laughs> um, in the east you got union as favorites i don't think any surprises there what's a team that you think could be like a dark horse to shake up the standings in the eastern conference in the east i mean for me i'm, I'm really big on on charlotte and like this kind of looks stupid in a few months but i do think <laughs> that they're going to be a top seven team like and again maybe i'm putting too much credit into what they did kind of down the stretch and what i think enzo capetti is going to be but even higher up like Do doyle kind of uh beat me to this because he, he's like fc cincinnati like I I think I put them at second. Like I think they're going to be incredible. I think they're going to be great. Like a full season of Miazga and Wobodo and everything else. I thought that they did was real. Getting a real right wing back was huge with, with Santiago mm -hmm. Arias. But I have them second. Duel had him first. So like I can't even I can't even claim that hill. But yeah. So since he would probably be it for me. Yeah. Uh -huh. And he had the fact that they kept Brenner through all the the rumors. Like that's going to be huge for them. Yeah. For sure. He'll probably be gone in the summer. And at least it gives them more time to. Um, get a get a replacement or find another guy but like again even without him like a front line of a uh, front three of vasquez sergio santos and lucho is so really strong yeah just wild like just so much talent same kind of thing here in the west i guess ne not necessarily a dark horse but you have the galaxy number one which was much higher than everybody else surveyed <laughs> um the talent is certainly there like we took we took ricky pooch third overall in the oh best my God. Draft, so we're him, believers man. um and but we've talked about the boycott a lot here on the pod because we like to kind of dive into some of the other oh. MLS news as well. Why should the Galaxy not be worried about that boycott becoming a distraction? Because I mean, if they have no fan, no supporters groups at the the El Trafico next weekend, like I don't know, yeah. what, what's going on there? That'd be that'd be it's, yeah, it's a, it's a really tough situation. Um, I'm always pro the fans making their voice felt like mm. you no, know, it's difficult for the Galaxy. I think Greg Vanny had a quote that was, you know, I hey, like I understand and we love them and everything, but like I don't. I think he said in so many words, I don't, there's things that, that probably won't change or can't be impacted. It's just probably not going to go over very well, but yeah. I, I don't know. It is a tough situation. We'll see. I, I guess that their bet is that, yeah, you'll, you'll come back at, at whenever, like, Hey, like maybe we'll hopefully that they're opening dialogue with the fan groups. I don't, again, I don't know the ins and outs of this. I haven't, I haven't really talked to anybody, so don't have a, a ton to say on this, but yeah, mm -hmm. like it's a thing. Um, I, I'm not sure that it's gonna, you know, it, it, it should be viewed very seriously 
and it should be like noted on broadcast. Oh, there, this is why that this section's empty or this is why this section's quiet. But I think like when you're in the game, like it gives you an edge with your home field stuff. But like, I, I don't think that they're going to be in danger of, of, you know, losing games at home that they were going to win. Like, again, I just think that they're very talented. A, fu- a funny point about me putting them first. I got a text from like one of my editors. He's filling, filling it in. He's like, you did mean the galaxy and not LAFC, <laughs> right? Like, I, I just wanted to double check because you are the only person that has them. In, in, like, but a few other people have LAFC first. Like, just want to be safe here. And I was like, yeah, man, wasn't a typo. <laughs> yeah, man, <laughs> I've I've had similar questions from an editor at the site that I work at for NBA content about some of my predictions. So, yeah, so I feel that. Fine, right? like, are you yeah. sure you meant that? <laughs> Last one here for the MLS stuff that I want to ask you about best ball and we'll get you out of here. I have to say this. You have FC Dallas second and Austin fourth. On behalf of all Austin fans, <laughs> how dare you? <laughs> no real question there and i think like i mean we on the, obviously we have the rivalry and it it gets heated on twitter between the fan yeah, bases good fun, freq- man. almost on the daily um <laughs> but we have a lot of respect for dallas not just their first team but the the franchise as a whole with their academy like yep. even as younger mls fans we can recognize that so um you know and the copa tejas that's a real trophy okay <laughs> so. i agree that those games were awesome like, i really yeah love it. Yeah, I uh, the I guess the only complaint we had about that was the uh, offset schedules where we play each of those teams three times. Dallas and Houston only plays twice, so the Copa Teos committee figured all that out. But <laughs> come on, MLS, we got to get those schedules right for the the big rivalry games. Yeah, um, so I didn't. I, what I wanted to do and I, I forgot to do was send you the uh, results from the four team best ball draft. Uh, so I'm going to do that mm-hmm. afterwards, and hopefully okay. you can. You know, it's prediction season, so hopefully <laughs> you can tell me who you like all right, uh, I will. after we finish. But my question is, I'm worried, a little worried about this. We drafted Georgie Petrovich as our top keeper. Yeah. We only get two. Uh, and this week you reported that Manchester United is heavily scouting him. Nothing imminent. But should we worry about losing our top keeper during the season? Because we may have to do like a summer transfer window for the best ball team. So we can oh, yeah. At the summer, yeah. This is a real possibility. Like maybe, you, again, like United are, like they've seen him a lot in person. They've been to just about all the game. Like they're there all the time. Like. I try to be careful about reporting air quote interest because it can be nebulous. It can be difficult to define. Like, what does this exactly mean? Like when I'm telling you that like they're, they're really watching them. Like this is, this is not just kind of nonsense. This isn't somebody trying to stir something. Right. So mm-hmm. it's real, whether he ends up at United or not, I think it's important to understand that these are the kind of teams that are looking at him. We'll see what happens in the summer. Like, like they didn't, they didn't necessarily want to lose Matt Turner, but it's just a reality of the game, reality of the business. Right. And, when Arsenal comes in with seven million up front, you gotta do it. So <laughs> is Petrovic gonna be 10? Is he gonna be I think he's gonna be more than Turner because of his age and because of his kind of pedigree as well? Wow. He's gonna be 12. Like how much is it gonna cost? And and again, if a bid like Gaga Sonita's bid comes in this this off season, this summer, what are you gonna do? And like yeah. the player's probably gonna push for it. Like, why not? Like I I would understand that. So I'm not saying that hundred percent he's leaving in the summer, but I can tell you it's a real it's a real possibility. It's definitely something to, to keep an eye on. Do you think that that's like a good, a, uh, not necessarily a good, but good for the league in general to see these guys kind of going to these much more prominent large yeah. clubs? You think that's good over, to lose that talent? The void is can still be filled in. Yeah, and like, look, like you, we talked about Brenner a little bit before. Like Petrovic came. Like players didn't weren't coming from a, a smaller European league to here to go back to Europe for a bigger league, right? Like usually those transfers were okay. I'm in the Serbian league. And then maybe I'll go to Belgium or the Netherlands or, or wherever. Like MLS getting Georgi Petrovic, like that, that should be the good news because mm. Dejan Jovlic, like he came for $4 million at a Galaxy when he God, scored, He's like, a nightmare for us, Tom. I love him. I, I wish he could <laughs> yeah. play him. Um, but he came here when he was on loan at an Austrian team where he scored a lot of goals. That dude in the past always just signed with a French or a Belgian or a Dutch team. And then the idea to go back to the Bundesliga or the higher level. So if – the, if the if the revs were like no sorry you have a contract you can't leave players like that aren't coming so it's yeah. it's it's a really good development that we're in the global transfer market like Tiago Almada wouldn't have come here Alan Velasco like everybody knows that the next step is stay here for a few years and then go and even mm-hmm. somebody like Jesus Ferreira he's staying longer by signing a new like it's all good it's all good news and as long as as we're in the global transfer market, we're going to get a lot of players that are, are super exciting that five years ago we weren't going to get mm. cool. Well, Tom, we, we asked for 15 minutes. You gave us a half hour. We really appreciate it, man. Uh, anything else before you get out of here? Where can the people find you? I assume a new extra time coming later today. Uh, what you got going on? Yeah, Tuesday this week. Um, 
so yeah, that there's that human me extra time. MLS uh, where else? Instagram at Tom Bogart soccer. You know, I think I'm better on Twitter, but you know, we're, we're branching <laughs> out on Instagram. I think it's all right. So yeah, anywhere. Yeah, we've also got an Instagram in the works. So at the North End Pod, everybody. Uh, no <laughs> posts yet, but they are certainly coming with the season starting next week. Loading. Tom, once again, really appreciate it, man. And uh, hopefully we'll talk to you again sometime. Of course, boys. Cheers. Thanks, Tom. Man, uh, thanks again, for <laughs> Tom. That was, I had so much fun. I had some adrenaline going there because, I mean, again, like this is a guy who has made his mark on this league and not just this league, but I think world football, right. With some of the deals that he's reported, the rumors that he's broken and just um, seems like a really, really good dude. And we just really appreciate him, you know, humoring us through all those questions we threw at him, uh, you know, about much more than soccer. Big shout out to Tom. It was awesome. Uh, yeah, he he's he's a great dude and and uh, had a great time chatting with him and learned a lot of good stuff, valuable yeah. information. Absolutely. Um, yeah. And we have sent him the best ball roster results. And he told us at some point this week, oh, yeah. he'll get back to us with the prediction. So we got to laminate something. I'm hoping he says <laughs> that we're going to be in last so we can we can prove everybody wrong. But we'll see on that again. This is going to be a double pod week for us. So we will be back likely Thursday. Uh, Mm -hmm. with our first match preview of the season obviously we are five days away from the home opener against st louis city i think my hair just stood up on my arm i'm getting goosebumps just thinking about being back with all of our friends at q2 we'll have some nonsense on thursday as well because there's still more competitions you and i want to kick off against each other for this season so we'll have that as well on thursday and we appreciate everybody tuning in as always if you've got Five seconds to rate, review, and subscribe to the podcast, wherever you get your podcasts. Um, Or if you're listening to us on our YouTube channel, hit that subscribe button. You can hit the notification bell to know when a new episode or a live stream goes live. Uh, And hit the thumbs up on this video. Help us out there with the YouTube algorithm. Uh, E, anything else to add before we get out of here? It's game week, baby. (sighs) Chills, man. I'm excited. Can't wait to see everybody. Um, have a safe week and, um, we'll be there, baby. We're yeah. ready to go. Yeah. And we will talk to everybody on Thursday for Ian. I'm Zach. Vamos Austin FC, everybody. Goodbye. Three, two, one.